<clears throat> well, please turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, back in our Matthew series for today. So hopefully uh, you remember our, the last time we were in Matthew. Today we're actually looking at uh, anger. Interestingly enough, when was the last time that you were really angry with someone? Or the last time you, you said under your breath like a, uh, you know, an evil word about someone? Oh, you fool, you idiot, you stupid guy. When was the last time you did that, I wonder? Well, now our passage today... Jesus is going to be speaking about anger. You know, it's funny, our culture has a, a, a vision of like what a Christian is like. And often uh, the, the idea is that someone who doesn't get angry, no matter what happens, like if you watch like The Simpsons or something, there's that guy called Ned Flanders. I don't know if you guys know about him. But he's, uh, he's like the, the next door Christian who's like ever long suffering and never gets angry at anyone because uh, Christians don't get angry, right? <laughs> well, Jesus... In this passage, he's going to be talking about anger. He's actually going to teach us how to read the Old Testament. And uh, the reason being is because the Pharisees, when they read through the Old Testament, they used to, you know, they'd come across these commands like don't murder. And they would totally miss what the command was talking about. They'd miss the heart of the commandment. So Jesus, in this passage, is going to correct them. And as he does that, we're going to learn a valuable lesson ourselves in the process too. So let's look at our text today from Matthew. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. <coughs> Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. This is the word of the Lord. He said, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Now, hopefully everyone remembers last time we are in Matthew, we got up to verse 20, right? We read 17 to 20. We were looking at what it means to surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees in order to get into the kingdom of heaven. We talked about how if you want to get into heaven, you have to have a better righteousness than what the Pharisees had. Like the, the high level, you know, uh, religious leaders, you've got to surpass them. We talked about how the only way to get to heaven is through the righteousness of Christ alone. Because we've all broken God's law. We're all sinners before him. But Jesus never sinned. He is holy and he took upon himself our sin, our curse. And he bore it in his own body and died on the cross he defeated death and he rose again. And then what he did was he took his righteousness and placed it on you. His good works, his good deeds were placed on your account. And so we become righteous through, through faith alone in Christ. And this is the, that's the great exchange, right? Our sin goes to Christ. His righteousness comes on us. And so through faith alone, a gift of God, not a works, we become saved. That is how to surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees. And what this will lead to is that we will understand the law properly, better than what the, um, the Pharisees understood. Because they weren't actually correct. They were very careful in their scholarship. They, uh, they did all their memorization. They, they could recite the law to you, but they weren't actually correct in their understanding of the law. They had an outward appearance of righteousness. If you look at them, you'd be like, oh, yeah. He's working hard to keep the law. You know, there's one of the laws says you're meant to have, like, God said to inscribe the, the, the law of God on the sides of your, um, what are these parts called? Not earlobes. 
the, they're called phylacteries. I can remember that. I can't remember what this part's called. The phylacteries are the, the hanging. You know, you've seen it before, right? The Jews would would have these uh, these scrolls of the law written uh, next to their next to the side of the head to hang down. So they have this outward, external presence of like, oh, holiness, oh, righteousness, and yet inside they were dirty. And Jesus calls them out for that. They were honoring God with their lips, but their hearts were far from him. Now, God actually wants true righteousness to shine forth from us because we as Christians are under the law of Christ. And the law of Christ begins with loving the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul and strength and loving our neighbor as ourselves. And in this section here, Jesus is going to correct the Pharisees misunderstanding. In fact, there's six Six misunderstandings that he's going to go through. This is the first one we'll do today. He, uh, he goes through six antitheses, we call them. So he, he tells the people, like, you've heard it said, but I say to you. You've heard, them, you've heard this before, but I'm telling you this. That's the antithesis that he's going to use to uh, correct them. Now, it was very unusual for people to hear this. In fact, probably no one who was listening to Jesus' sermon had ever heard a rabbi say, Hey, you know, you've heard this before, but listen to me. <laughs> listen to what I tell you. Probably no one had ever heard that before. Normally when a rabbi would get up to speak, he would ground his assertions in the teachings of other rabbis. So they might say something like, a hundred years ago, Rabbi Shofar said this, so therefore I'm saying this. That was how they taught the people. The people weren't used to rabbis leaning on their own authority, like Jesus does here. You've heard this, but I tell you, I say to you. It's exactly what Jesus does here, leaning on his own authority. The reason is, is because Jesus is perfect in his authority. He is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. A couple of years ago, I heard a uh, discussion on a, on a TV show in the States where they had the, uh, a group of LGBT activists speaking with a Christian pastor. And uh, the Christian pastor was saying he was asserting the biblical view. You know, marriage is between a man and a woman. If it's not a man and a woman, it's not marriage. And the, um, one of the activists responded, said, well, that's just one opinion. My opinion's different. I think that marriage can be between anyone. And the Christian responded like this. When you predict your own death and resurrection and then carry it out, we'll listen to your opinion. But until then, we're going to listen to Jesus. Because he is king of kings. He is lord of lords. He is the one who taught us that a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife in one flesh. That is what marriage is all about. The key point is that Jesus does have all authority in heaven and on earth. So he has the authority to teach us. If, imagine if Jesus did what the other rabbis did, right? Imagine if he said, um, you've heard it said this, but Rabbi Shofar from 100 years ago says this. Imagine if Jesus did that. He'd actually be going back a step because he has more authority than any other rabbi. It'd be like if one of my boys, you know, went to, went to another boy and said, hey, you got to clean your room. And then the second boy said, why? Why do I have to clean my room? Who says? And then the first boy said, well, the youngest brother told us. <laughs> All right. There's where the authority is. It doesn't make any sense. The youngest brother can't tell the older, older brothers what to do. That's why it is wrong for Jesus to call on any other authority other than himself. He is the final authority. He has perfect authority. There is no authority greater than his own. He is the Messiah. And his interpretation of the law is perfect. And that's why, ultimately, in this section, we'll say, he's, we're, not, we're not saying that he's correcting the law. He's correcting an interpretation. And he's doing so with authority. He's giving six antitheses here. The first one's this. You've heard it said, you shall not murder. But I say to you, those who are angry with their brother or insult someone, you'll be liable to judgment. Wow. If I'm angry or if I insult someone, I will be liable to judgment. Kids, what does liable mean? We don't use it that often, do we? Liable. I'm not sure if you heard that word before. Liable means that you are responsible before the law. The law is calling you out. You are legally answerable for what you've done. So the law 
And normally, uh, for us, the law is represented by police officers, right? The court system. The law is calling you to account for your crimes, and you must face the punishment. You must, be, you must answer. You are liable. The word liable here, Jesus says, you will be liable of judgment. Of course, he's not talking about the New Zealand police, is he? Now, he does mention the, the council, you see. He says, uh, you'll be liable to the council. Now, the council was the, they were called the Sanhedrin. So there was uh, 71 men, like leaders of the Jews, and they were the highest court system in the land. They were the ones who handed Jesus over to be, to be um, murdered. So they had the power to hand you over to capital punishment. So it's like Jesus is saying, you will be in danger of being handed over to capital punishment. If you, if you are angry or if you say you fool about your brother. So if, you can, if you're condemned to, to death by the council, your, your fate is sealed. It's like, uh, you know, in New Zealand, we talk about being imprisoned, right? Like the people, for the people hearing Jesus, they understood their system of justice. And the New Zealand court system would be like, you know, if you break a law, we, we call that a crime, right? You've committed a crime. And if you commit a crime, you can go before the judge and you can be judged as guilty of your crime. And then you can receive a sentence, which means that you need to be put in prison, right? We use, uh, in New Zealand, we use prison, home detention sometimes, fines. You can be given a fine. We have to pay the money or maybe even community service. You're told to work for free. So there's various, various punishments for various crimes. The, our justice system here in New Zealand you could say that it's somewhat modeled off God's justice system, but it's not nearly as just, it's not nearly as righteous as what God has prescribed. And actually, we recognize the weakness uh, when we see people here in New Zealand commit serious crimes. What year was it that guy in Christchurch went through the mosques shooting a whole bunch of people? 2019, was it? And then what was his, uh, his sentence? Was it 20 years? Life, life, called, called life. Well, imagine, I mean, when we see someone commit a really serious crime, you know, like just imagine someone, you know, like rape and murder, put in prison. When that person is only, you know, is let out of prison again, only after a few years, it actually, something happens in our hearts, right? We're like, man, that's not right. That person should continue to pay for his sin, for his crime. That person should continue to be punished. If someone's let out early, it's like, kind of seems to denigrate the value of the people that were killed. There's that other example in Norway, right? That guy who went on the island and shot a bunch of kids um, a while ago. He was given 20 years uh, in a very lax prison system. And so if he's, uh, if he's let go in another, I think it was 10 years ago probably, so another decade, if he's let go, we're going to feel in our hearts, this is wrong. Like, he killed so many people. That we're, we're reducing the value of the life that was taken when we say, you're okay to go now. He's what, like 50 years old now and goes off to live his life. The dead people are unable to enjoy their lives on earth because of the decisions he made. So we got this, we got this system in New Zealand and other countries where something's lacking. There's something wrong with our justice system. And what it's lacking is perfect justice. And we know it in our hearts. We feel it. Unless we're strong enough in our, in our suppression of the knowledge of God, our hearts are actually uncomfortable when we hear of people <coughs> being released from prison for early for good behavior. It's because the punishment doesn't seem to fit the crime. But God's justice system is a perfect justice system. It's the one that our hearts are crying out for. He prescribes the death penalty for murder. He, he prescribes a place of fire. We see there in, the, in our text, place of hell, fire for all who sin against him. We hear about this place called hell in our Revelation 21. As for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, there they are, murderers, the sexually immoral, that's got a bigger group now, hasn't it? Sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, uh-oh, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. This is the word of God, and it is true. Hell is an unending torment, a place of burning day and night forever and ever. 
And look at this list of people who will go there. Does anyone see themselves in that list? It's extremely terrifying to think about that. To think that I will be held liable. I will be judged. One day everyone is going to stand before the judge of all the earth and face him. And we must give an account for what we've done and what we've said. And we should be scared. You know, it's a little bit like when uh, children. Children should be afraid of being physically punished by their parents. It's actually without that fear of physical punishment, they kind of miss the opportunity to be happy and thrive with their parents in a relationship that's characterized by obedience. That's why actually the Bible tells us to physically discipline our children. It's another thing that our culture's got wrong, haven't we? This is an idea where we as parents really need to recognize God's authority. It's greater than the state. It outweighs the state authority. You know, God didn't set the government, government up to tell you or to prevent you from disciplining your children. He set the government up. The role of the government is to punish evildoers and to help us live a godly life. That is what the government is for. That's a side note to the sermon, a free side note there. But children should fear the possibility of physical consequences when they disobey their parents because it helps them to learn about God's system of justice. We should fear that there are physical consequences to our sin. When we hear about hell, we should be terrified of the consequence of sin. Problem is, is we don't, we don't fear God like we should. We're not frightened enough of the coming judgment. Jesus himself said, don't fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Don't be afraid of people. They can't. They don't have an effect on your soul. Your soul is eternal. It will live. Not eternal. It will live. It's immortal. It will live forever. Don't fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So Jesus commands us to fear God. He wants us to be terrified at the prospect of being thrown into hell, where both our soul and our body will be destroyed. So my question to you today is, are you scared of hell? Are you scared of being liable to judgment? Because you should be. And Jesus says here, he mentions the hell of fire. In the Greek, it's uh, Gehenna. You might have heard, in fact, your translation might say Gehenna. So Gehenna was this place just outside Jerusalem, in the southwest corner. It was a place where historically the people had sacrificed humans to Molech back in ancient times. And by the time Jesus was born, it was used instead to put all the rubbish from Jerusalem and then burn it. So it was like a constant fire, always burning through the rubbish from the city. Now, obviously, when he, when he uses this word Gehenna, he, it's a symbol of a place that continues burning. The worm does not, does not die. The fire is not quenched. It's pointing us symbolically to eternal final judgment, a place we call hell. And Jesus talked more about hell than anyone else in the Bible. He said that, that hell is a place of fire. And normally when we think about fire, it's like, oh, it's very bright. But he said, no, it's dark. It's darkness and fire, intense pain and suffering. And you definitely do not want to end up going there. If you look down at verse 30, you'll see that Jesus says, it's better to lose part of your body that's causing you to sin rather than your whole body go into hell. So if, you're, if your hand is causing you to sin, it's better to cut it off so that you can go to heaven and your hand is gone. And that's better than, than keeping your hand and going into hell. That's a pretty drastic approach, is it not, to sin? It means we should be so serious with our sin that we should be willing to cut off our own hand to avoid sinning. How much more radical should we be then and when we consider our own media consumption, for example? Do you have an app on your phone, perhaps, or your device? Or is there a website that's causing you to sin? Maybe it's time to delete it or just get rid of the whole device. It's time for us to be drastic in our fight against sin because God, Jesus is warning us here of the hell of fire and we do not want to be thrown in there. Getting thrown into hell is not a temporary punishment. 
facing this, this liability is not a temporary thing like it is in the New Zealand court system. This is an eternal punishment. Jesus describes it as an eternal punishment. He contrasts it with the, the righteous going into eternal life and those who are accursed are go, going into eternal punishment. In verse 26 here, he says that you will not be released from prison until you've paid the last penny. Obviously, speaking of a judge who exacts perfect justice, doesn't let you get away with a, a single cent less than what you have to pay. This is a reference to the fact that God in his terrifying wrath will exact every ounce of punishment that we deserve in hell. The really frightening thing is that those who are sent to hell are not just those who carry out the actual act of murder. But as we see here, Jesus says it's even those who are angry with their brother that are liable. So Jesus is telling us, look at the law and look deeper. Don't just look at the external aspects of the commandment. Look at the inward state of our hearts. Murder begins with anger and hatred. You think about Cain. We've been going through Genesis. How did Cain end up murdering his brother Abel? God warned him, did he not, beforehand. Sin is desiring to have you. It's crouching at the door. You must rule over it. It's already in his heart he was angry. Already in his heart there was hatred. There's always been a clear connection with the state of our hearts and our, what we end up doing, our external sinful action. It's not a new teaching. In fact, the... It's really a restatement of what God had already made clear in the law. In Leviticus 19, verse 18, he said, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. See, not taking vengeance or bearing a grudge is directly connected here to the character of God. And we are called to reflect who he is. That's the reason why there's so many, so many commands in the Bible about our Christian concern of the heart. We ought to be concerned about our hearts. You think about some of these following passages that I brought up here. I'll do a few quick fire verses about this. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. From James 1. Think about Ecclesiastes 7. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the hearts of fools. Proverbs 14. Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. Another proverb from chapter 16. Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. You know what that's saying? That's saying... Look at, uh, look at Alexander, king of the Greeks, leading his, his army into battle on his horse, right? Taking over a city. Look at his, his might and power. Isn't that amazing and so impressive? And God here is saying, you know what's better than that? You know what's more impressive? Is if you rule over your own spirit. If you are slow to anger. So that might raise a question in your mind. Is it always wrong for us to be anger, angry. Is it, is it always wrong to be angry? You might think the answer is, uh, yes, it is, because of what Jesus said. But no. Actually, Jesus himself showed moral indignation and anger. Remember when he, uh, when he threw the money changers out of the temple? There were people in the temple who were stealing money off the poor. Jesus sat down, made a whip of cords. Think about what was going through his mind as he's looking up at those people stealing money from the poor. He makes a whip of cords, goes out, drives them out of the temple. One time when uh, the, he asked the Pharisees, is it right for me to heal on the Sabbath? There's a guy right here with a, uh, a crooked arm, a, a dis disability. And Jesus says to the Pharisees, is it right for me to heal him? And they wouldn't answer. He looked around in anger at them, indignant at the hardness of their hearts. I think the... The difference is, when we look at Jesus, is that he was slow to anger, first of all. Secondly, that he was not angry at people as much as he was angry at sin that was occurring. He wasn't hating his neighbor in his heart when he, when he became angry. You can see, actually, he didn't get angry because 
we can see when he was angry that he wasn't hating people because he didn't even get angry when people mistreated him. He went to the, the cross like a lamb led to the slaughter without opening his mouth. And Peter, later on, when he was talking about Christ, he said, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. See, Christ is our model of entrusting himself to his Father. When Jesus became angry, it wasn't for his own sake. It was actually for the sake of other people. See, we tend to get angry when people do bad things to us for ourselves, right? But ang Jesus was angry at sin, not in a quick-to-anger way, but in a perfect and godly way. So we need, to be, we need to be careful with anger and contempt because they can lead to murder. 1 John 3.15 says, Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Now what does it mean to show contempt? Kids, I wonder if you've heard that word before. Contempt. I'm showing this person contempt. That means when you're, you're thinking about someone in your, in your heart, in your mind, you're thinking about that person and you're thinking, this person is worthless. This person is just a waste. There's plenty of contempt flying around in our day and age as well. I wonder what your feeling is when you go to the restaurant, you go to pick up some food and you see a beggar on the street. What is your feeling towards that person? How do you feel about the multitudes of old people in our country who are approaching death and yet don't have family to look after them? What is the state of your heart when you consider your unborn neighbor? Is she worthless to you? I think what we say about those who we hold in contempt, it really reveals a lot about our hearts. Do you stand up for the rights of the voiceless? Or do you show them contempt by not speaking out for them? Jesus said that out of the abundance of his heart, the mouth speaks. So the way that people in that day and age could show the most contempt for someone was here. He said by using the word raka. I wonder if your translation says fool or raka. Jesus says, don't use this word. Calling someone a name like that was very, very serious. Especially in, in the ancient times when, you know, your name and your reputation and who you are was attached very much to how people saw you. It was, they lived in a, a shame-based culture. We live in more of a guilt-based culture. But Jesus said, you shall not call your brother Raka. Now, uh, it's, sometimes it's been unfortunate, like in the ESV here, they've translated it as full, which is not incorrect, but the, the word for full is different. There's another word that's used all over the Bible. This, this word's used once, raka. There's a lot, another word that's used for full, which is everywhere. But this word raka is different. In the lexicon, it says that it's kind of like saying you, you are an empty-headed fool. So it's really referring to the intellectual capability of the person. You're, you're expressing contempt for somebody's mind. You know, nowadays we might say something like, you stupid idiot, you dummy, you moron, something like that. But it is important to recognize this, this word only occurs once. It's not the word used for fool. It's not the word that Jesus uses when he calls the Pharisees blind fools. He uses that in uh, Matthew 23, 17. He denounced the Pharisees because of their, their legalism and their attacks on the people of God. He called them blind fools. Different word, not this word, raka. So the other places we see the word show up, like when Jesus used it, it seems to be more about moral kind of foolishness rather than intellectual. Paul did the same thing in Galatians. Remember in Galatians 3, he said, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And we know that Paul didn't have contempt for the Galatians in his heart because immediately he goes on to call them brothers, beloved brothers. And then he calls them my children, beloved children. And he says, I, I'm confident that you will believe the right thing, that you'll, you'll go the right way. So we really need to make a distinction in our, in our minds between this word, raka, and the common word we see in the Bible of fool, foolishness. So here in Matthew, used once in the Bible, we might, we might think of it as empty-headed fool. So we are not to have that kind of contempt for people. And then Jesus says, before, before you go to the altar of God to offer a sacrifice to him, you need to sort out this issue with your brother. 
So he, he's explaining that our priority should be to deal with the offense and to seek reconciliation. This is how we as Christians should approach situations where we have been, where people have taken offense because of us. And it's interesting that here it's connected to the thought in the context, seemingly saying, don't let other people have something against you and be angry at you because they might have murderous thoughts come up in their hearts. Don't let people think in their hearts raka about you. Don't let people disconnect. Do what you can to connect with them and reach out and love our brother. Act to prevent murderous feelings towards yourself. Don't put yourself in a situation where someone might be tempted to say about you raka. Now that's easier said than done, isn't it? Because it takes two to tango. Not everyone's going to be willing to interact with you when they are offended. In fact, Paul says in Romans, if it is possible, as far as depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So certainly, there's the conceit, we concede that it may be impossible if someone refuses your plea for peace. But we must try. Believers must try to make peace. Jesus goes on here, he says, he mentions that you might have the accusations heard before a judge and the possibility of being put in prison. He tells us to avoid this. In fact, it's very similar advice to what Paul gave in 1 Corinthians 6 when he, he talked about one of us having, a, one of you has a grievance against another. Do you dare, does he dare go to the law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you not, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? You see, having lawsuits among believers and taking them in front of secular courts is wrong. We shouldn't end up before the judge being judged. We should avoid having church issues go before unbelievers. It's important for many reasons, not the least of which is that the secular rulers have the power to put you in prison over a debt. Something that the Sanhedrin wouldn't even do, the Jewish council. But there's another reason. It's because you will, be, you will be required to pay to the very last cent. And that reminds us of God's perfect justice. He is the perfect judge. And he will make sure that we are all held to account for our words and our works. And there's one more aspect to this question that it's important for us to consider. As Christians, we shouldn't get angry with our brother. We shouldn't seek vengeance when we're wronged. Why not? Why shouldn't we do that? And that's because God will have the ultimate vengeance. He will repay. He is the avenger of blood. It's like our communal reading today and yesterday, looking, at, um, looking into uh, Exodus, when the, when the Israelites were escaping from Egypt, and Moses told them, don't be afraid, God will fight for you. God is the one. He is the one. He says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And so we can entrust our souls to a faithful creator, just like Jesus did. Just like Jesus entrusted himself to him who judges righteously and didn't respond when he was being accused and attacked. So we respond by submitting to God. And therefore, we are going to be patient, not angry, patient, kind, and forgiving one another. God tells us in Ephesians, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So this is key. We all deserve the wrath of God. We all deserve... We are all deserving and liable to the hell of fire because of our sin. So we ought to be forgiving to one another because in Christ, God has forgiven us of all of our sins and removed them as far as the east is from the west. So how do we conclude then today? Well, let us not get angry at each other. Let us not insult one another, knowing that we are liable to the fire of hell. Let us instead give place to to wrath, not seek to avenge ourselves. Let us know that God is the righteous judge of all the earth. He will do right. 
He will vindicate his people. And Jesus is our model to follow. He's the one who didn't fight to defend himself. And yet he stood up in anger to defend the rights of the poor and the downtrodden. So don't become a a pacifist or a pushover. Stand up for the rights of those who are poor. It's a reminder for us that we shouldn't get overly angry at people and condemn them in our minds. We should remember that we have been forgiven great sins. And that fact alone should stir us to be forgiving to one another and those who wrong us. So let us be like Christ in our lives and may God bring a blessing upon the meditation of his word today. Let's pray together. Father, we're so thankful to you for your word. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for correcting our misapprehension, our misunderstandings of your law, of your word. We hear this call, Lord, not to be angry, not to show contempt for people by calling them names. We hear this, Lord, and we know in our hearts that we are guilty before you for breaking your law. And in your sight, we are as murderers. We pray for forgiveness. We confess our sins to you. We pray for forgiveness, Lord, that you would cleanse us from all our sin, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Lord. And Father, we pray that you would help us to live lives where we are forgiving of one another. We are patient. We are kind. We are loving. Help us, Lord, to surpass the the idea that people have in their heads about Christians being so loving and gentle and kind. Lord, help us to surpass this in our own lives. Help us to bring glory and honor to you, to be a blessing to one another. We ask all these things for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Call Richard up again. Thank you, brother.